This is The Green Line, a five-part miniseries focusing on the near-term geopolitical implications of climate change. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. People who analyze Chinese politics often talk about the fact that these citizens of China have been willing to accept the good with the bad when it comes to the Chinese government, but mostly because at the time the economic situation was improving and that this generation lives a far more comfortable lifestyle than the previous one did in many ways. But what happens when that social contract between the government and the people is broken, and when the central government fails to actually mitigate disasters, when they're unresponsive to overlapping crises, and when the people have no representation and can't vote them out? All of these problems culminate in one central issue, which is how is China and its bureaucracy preparing for climate change? And that's the main question we're going to be asking today. If you haven't figured it out already, this is part two of our five-part series discussing the geopolitics of near-term climate change, so climate change within this decade, focusing on everything from the US military's response to climate change, to burgeoning conflicts over water, to what a post-fossil fuel economy would likely look like to nations that get 90% of their capital from it. And as I outlined in the previous episode, we're not here to debate whether climate change is man-made or not, or which countries it'll blame. We're just here to look at the data, analyze the pressure points, and create models on how these countries are likely to respond to the geopolitical and security pressures brought on by these events. So for this episode, let's talk about China, where climate change is going to have the largest impact on the country, which parts of the bureaucracy are preparing for climate change, and which parts aren't, and how these climate pressures are likely to shape Beijing's relationships with its neighboring states. And to take us through some of the data and how China arrived at this position, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Finding the Fault Lines So the thing with China is that the way in which decisions are made under this government is highly centralized. And so when they're confronted by a major problem like climate change, that matters a lot. Because when decisions go right in that kind of system, they, of course, go very right. But when they go wrong, they go quite wrong. And so when you look at the combination of information that we see about China, it's a little bit worrisome in the sense that you have both a near term climate effect that they appear to be unprepared for, along with a leadership structure that probably isn't going to be so responsive to that reality once it hits. Lou Munden leads the Mission Climate Project which is focused on the social, political, and economic impacts of climate change in the 2020s. The project does risk analysis on a wide range of countries, China included, and we're thrilled to have them on the program today. So when you hear about temperatures going up by one and a half degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius, we have to remember that that's global warming, which sounds gradual because it is. You know, every year we're making the atmosphere retain just a little more heat from the sun because of the carbon pollution that we put out there. But where I think science has confused people, and this includes people in defense, is by focusing on the global warming more than the climate change that it actually causes. Because the story, especially the story for the military, is the droughts, the floods, the heat waves, the fires. These are the things that cause crop failures through water scarcity. These are the things that cause blackouts by interrupting hydroelectric dams. These are the things that interrupt supply chains. And they wreck infrastructure. And they cause social unrest because when people get hot, they get irritable, angry, and tend to react violently. In other words, those are the kinds of things that cause societies to become unstable, and that's what needs to be focused on. So what we do at Mission, with the Mission Climate Project, is, is, is pretty unique. Most groups focus on that instability to the extent that they do the research in 2040 or 2050 or later. We focus on the 2020s, so this decade, and that's where we worry that China has some really significant problems. So looking at the data here, what are the major problems we're likely to see pop up over the next five to 10 years inside China? We've done some fairly in-depth analysis internally, ranking every single bioregion of the world based on how much their hazard risk would increase over this decade. And a little more than 86% of China's population is an area that we would classify as high risk. And that was by far the worst score of any major economy, also of any significant military power. And some of those risks are really remarkable. So if you, you know, for example, look at the bioregion in the southern coast of China, so this is like Guangzhou or Fujian provinces, our data suggests the probability of extreme heat events could increase sixfold from 2017 to 2031, so just a little bit less than 15 years. And at the exact same time, the probability of extreme drought could increase by even more 
So that's even seven times higher over that period. So in other words, even though global warming might only increase by say half a degree Celsius over that period of time, so we have this impression of this rather in incremental and small change, the climate change that we see from that global warming is likely to be a lot more extreme uh, in China. We're trying to get a little bit more specific picture of this by looking at something that we call hazard overload, where these hazards keep happening in quick succession. So not a lot of time in between them to recover. And that'd be something like a heat wave following in the flood in the span of a few months, or a typhoon following the summer after a short drought in the winter, things like that. So that's what the data says, but what about the political and security aspect of this? How do you see the Chinese state and the military responding to these challenges? What we can tell so far is that China seems to score really badly there too. So to give another example, we think that China's drier regions, so Tibet, Xinjiang, Qinghai, places like that, they'll certainly have, have had this kind of hazard overload happening to them by the end of the decade. And chances are at the same time that we're gonna see that too in at least a couple of provinces along China's seacoast. So all of that to say, it's really not an encouraging picture from a hazard perspective that we see for China. With that in mind, can you take us through some of the challenges that China is already facing at the moment? There's three key challenges that jump out of us. The first is whether anyone really understands this is coming. So for example, this summer, 16 different government ministries released this jointly developed national climate change adaptation strategy. And one element of that strategy is a climate impact and risk assessment system. And that's gonna cover the whole of China and provide early warning services and data that you can use for planning, et cetera. And that, all that's really great on one hand, but on the other, the strategy says they're not bringing this online until 2035. And that suggests very strongly that they do not understand that they're going to have a problem well ahead of that. We can also guess that in the time frame of these risks that we're talking about, that Xi Jinping is probably still going to be in charge when they start to happen. And I would be very concerned about a dynamic in which a highly centralized leadership is caught completely by surprise in that way. Um, a second challenge is the preparedness of the PLA specifically. And so what we've read and heard there suggests that they are way behind. And I do mean very far behind where Western militaries are in thinking about this problem. The Ministry of Defense's last strategy white paper uh, in 2019 doesn't even mention climate change. And that matters a lot because if they get a sudden increase for in demands for help for humanitarian interventions internally, and you know they aren't ready for that, this means that ordinary Chinese citizens are going to be left to face a bunch of these risks on their own. And that seems pretty worrisome to us. Last, there's, there's this kind of third challenge, which is the circumstances that pre-exist this, what we anticipate is going to be a significant increase in climate impacts in China. And, and that's because they're going to suffer economically from all this. So they're already having trouble with the first signs of their aging population, plus the fallout from zero COVID. And there's this additional risk that climate hazards start to drop in a period where China is pretty weak economically. If you take that picture together and you look at those different pieces, you've got a centralized leadership that's caught by surprise, probably a few near East now when everyone in, in the upper echelons, including Xi, is a little bit older, so a little bit less willing to hear bad news. You have a military which is unable to respond to these disasters because of a lack of preparedness. You have an economic situation piled on top of that uh, that's highly disruptive. That combination would suggest that it's going to be more difficult to maintain domestic stability. So Xi Jinping's a real person. It's not really clear exactly how he's going to react to that set of circumstances, and his reactions matter very much. But what we can say from the data is that he's going to face a very difficult set of circumstances under which he's going to have to make some very good decisions in a very short period of time. In the first episode of this series, we discussed the US military's preparations for climate change. And during that piece, we laid out the situation that whilst the US legislative branch still quabbles with itself over climate change, the US Department of Defense views it very seriously and as a matter of national security, and in so has been rapidly preparing for the upcoming events. Do you see the PLA, or the People's Liberation Army, also leading the charge on climate change like the DOD is in the US? Or does the PLA still largely view this as a logistics or economic issue? I think they do view it as primarily a logistics issue at this point. And when the penny drops, this has come a lot faster and a lot quicker and is a lot more potentially destabilizing than they had originally thought. How does that new security lens change their reaction to all sorts of things? I would observe, though, that China, like a number of other nations in East Asia, so the Japanese, the Koreans, etc., have they've got good reasons to try to handle some parts of this problem. For a long time, being dependent on energy imports, for example, is a is a significant problem. It subjects Beijing to a lot of uh, a lot of relationships around the world that maybe they don't particularly want to get into. 
or some security risks in terms of potential blockades and, and, and the sort that they might like to avoid. Being able to get around that by being completely self-reliant in the, in the renewable space would be something that I would think would potentially be quite appealing to them. If we go back in history, one of the major advantages China was afforded was its rivers like the Yellow and the Yangtze. These rivers were almost to the day reliable in their flooding and receding, and in such, previous Chinese empires could plant two crops a season rather than one, allowing them to not only feed their people, but even sell on the surpluses to other neighboring states. It's one of the foundational blocks of China's rise. Now though, China, like many nations, is a net food importer, still making a lot of food within China, but having to make up the difference by importing food in from other countries. This year, we've already seen historically low levels in some of these rivers, and in turn, this is already beginning to have major impacts on Chinese crop yields. Looking at the data, do you anticipate this getting worse? And what stresses and impacts do you see on food security going forward due to this issue? Yeah, there's massive competition for water resources in China. They are pretty low on the list uh, in terms of country that you, countries that you would want to be in where facing water risk is concerned. So yes, absolutely, that's going to continue to be a problem. China is being seen more and more as a global competitor to the United States. And whilst the two of them saber rattle over Taiwan, the climate change issue extends far beyond that. Whilst these two are in direct competition over some issues, they will have to work together on others to mitigate the crisis. So how do you see the climate issue mapping on top of the security competition we're seeing between the US and China? I think there's competing forces, basically. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a simple answer. I think on one hand, in any condition of resource scarcity, and one of the immediate effects of climate change, even in the 2020s, is that it will start to create situations of resource scarcity or perceptions of resource scarcity. There is, of course, a natural tendency for countries which are strategic adversaries to compete. One example of this would be in the mineral sector. There are significant issues associated with transitioning from a fossil fuel-based economy to a minerals-based economy in that you have to start to then gravitate towards trying to figure out how you get the minerals from places in the world that have them in rich abundance, uh, Chile or you know, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia, places like that. And you can certainly see a scenario where there is pitched competition between Chinese and Western mining companies for access to those resources. And we were talking all about the geopolitics of energy transition in an upcoming episode of this series. One of the oddities of China though, is around data. As an economics guy myself, I have pretty high confidence that the figures released by the US Federal Reserve are for the most part accurate. China though often skews their data or in some cases just refuses to release it. And even if they only do this from time to time, it's hard to put full confidence on the figures coming out of Beijing. From someone who has been looking at outside data using things like satellite images and water levels, how do the official figures put out by Beijing compare to those from outside sources when it comes to issues around climate change? So this will be an interesting problem that'll start to crop up again and again, but uh, not in the way that you'd expect. Um, so right now, for example, this is, this is a live issue because China's delayed as we're recording this, the, the release of their, of their GDP figures, which has caused a lot of consternation among a lot of economic experts for obvious reasons. And that control over information externally is something that China is used to exercising. And they've been through rough patches economically before, and frankly, been able to smooth those over a little bit by fudging the numbers and making things appear a little bit more rosy than they are, thereby maintaining confidence. Well, climate impacts are significantly more difficult to hide because they tend to be manifest in a way that you can see with satellites. We have excellent access to all sorts of satellite data that will tell us pretty much in real time whether a given place has faced a significant climate impact, and the Chinese will not be able to control that sort of narrative. There's a reason that there are only two episodes in this series that are single country focused, and those two episodes are on the US and China, as these two nations have huge economic and strategic gravitational pulls. There are few countries on the entire planet that don't have some sort of reliance on trade or products coming out of China. So from what the economists and the analysts are telling us, what happens in China will greatly affect us here at home. But how accurate do you think that statement is? No, it is not going to just stay in China. This is something that we in Western democracies really need to understand that in a certain sense, much as the West may disagree with the current form of government, with the centralization under Xi Jinping, etc., China's problems are the West's problems. And there's kind of this overarching biophysical fact that, that I have to insist on, which is that we collectively, humans, need to be, beat climate change. 
there's just zero chance of doing that without Chinese cooperation and trade. I recognize that's an uncomfortable position for a whole bunch of democracies around the world, Washington chief among them. And it's going to be equally uncomfortable, I would observe, for Beijing to realize that they need stability and relationships too, most notably to guarantee their food security, which they can't possibly do by themselves. So these are the facts that we face, that we need to figure out how we're going to get along with each other in order to handle the problem. I recognize that everybody's not going to be friends and sing Kumbaya, but this whole problem is going to be a lot easier to handle if we realize that we have a common adversary in climate change and confronting it accordingly. Every time I go online, I always see comparisons in the relationship between the United States and China to that of the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And yes, whilst in some ways it's somewhat apt, what it doesn't take into account is the fact that during the Cold War, there was a pretty stark divide between the two states. That the US didn't actually do that much trade with the USSR. And that for the most part, Soviet agricultural policies in Ekaterinburg had very little impact on the farming practices of someone working in Wichita, Kansas. When it comes to China and the United States though, it cannot be understated how interconnected these two nations now are, with economists stressing that problems for one will cause problems for the other. And in such, the US has to conduct a very delicate balancing act between the two of them. In the US's mind, China becoming too strong would threaten the security of its allies in East Asia. But at the same time, China becoming too weak or falling apart would also devastate the US supply chain at the moment, with many of the components in the US supply chain still originating in China. So, sitting upon China's shoulders relies on the strength of the global economy. And with that in mind, we ask, how does the US view the climate change threat coming out of China? What is China's plan for actually tackling this issue? And what impacts are we already beginning to see bubble up in the heart of the world's second largest economy? Well, for that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Green Tides Forming Red Divides Already the Chinese leadership see patterns of agriculture in the country changing, patterns of secure water sources changing, changes in terms of drought and changes in terms of extreme weather events along China's coastline and across the uh, southern part of the country as well, where we've had extreme flooding. So for the Chinese, this is real. It's not abstract, which is why I'm always puzzled when people bring their hands about the need to be nice to Beijing in order to get them to act on climate change. China is acting on climate change because it's concerned about the implications for China, both its agriculture and uh, longer term, what it does in terms of the ability to sustain its people in various parts of the country. Kevin Rudd is the former Prime Minister of Australia and is widely regarded as leading the most impactful government and prime ministership the country had ever seen when it comes to climate change. Since leaving politics though, he's also become the President and CEO of the Asia Society and speaks fluent Mandarin. In addition to that, he's been named Senior Fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University where he leads the research team on the future China-United States Relations Committee. Additionally, he's also the chair of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism, the chair of the Sanitation and Water for All Committee, and the chairman of the board of the International Peace Institute. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. Well, the key question, I think, for China is the universal one, which is the physical cost of extreme weather events. But then you go to drought and it's the effectiveness on the arable nature of the North China Plain which is China's principal breadbasket. And therefore, when you start to look at the impact of sustained drought on the water table, a lot of the North China Plain is sustained by various forms of irrigation. You then have a, um, an impact in terms of China's ability to be self-sufficient in its grain supply. And in the politics of China's dynastic history, if there's a problem with grain supply, it translates quickly into the politics of the nation writ large. I'll start with the obvious question, which is, how seriously do you think Beijing is taking the threat of climate change? The consensus for political action in China on climate is driven by the obvious economic factors which arise from uncertainties of food supply long term, financial and economic factors arising from the impact on the human or built environment through extreme weather events, but also because China is acting very much in its own uh, intrinsic national security interests. It's one of the factors uh, contributing to the consensus within China to move forward in the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. With the discussion of food security within China, we should start with the topic of fishing. 
With fish stocks in the South China Sea already nearly down by a third, Chinese fishing boats are having to travel further and further out to find the same amount of fish. And quite often, they travel into other nations' territorial waters. How likely do you think it is that this will bring about a geopolitical flashpoint between China and one of its maritime neighbours? Well, if you look across the geopolitics of it, I mean, there's been a problem in terms of China's long-term source of supply for protein, and that has resulted from overfishing of China's, shall we say, coastal waters, hence why it pushes further out into contested waters into the East and, and South China Seas, and now beyond. One of China's driving interests in the South Pacific, for example, is to gain, I think, more preferential access to the vast fishing reserves and resources available in the exclusive economic zones of the Pacific Island countries. Of course, China, together with other states, engages in some degrees of illegal fishing already. But this is a, a real consideration in terms of securing protein resources for the long term. On agriculture more generally, I suspect that one of China's long-term interests with the Russian Federation will be its ability to lease or perhaps secure by other means tracts of currently underutilized agricultural land in the Russian Far East. China's northeast, that is Manchuria, is already a significant breadbasket together with the North China Plain. And so therefore, if you look on the Russian side of those borders, one of the things I'm sure our Chinese friends are thinking through is how can they utilize those lands uh, in the future should China's agricultural supplies from elsewhere in the country become stretched through climate impact. Returning to fishing for a second, we've already seen this issue boil over a few times before, with an example coming to mind of Chinese fishing vessels within northern Indonesian waters. This had been going on for a long time, and domestically, Jakarta was accused of being soft on China. So Indonesia beefed up the defenses in the Northern Islands and subsequently fired upon some of these Chinese fishing vessels. On this occasion, the situation wasn't public enough for either side to be forced to escalate in order to save face. But China hasn't stopped fishing in these surrounding waters, so if these ships are fired upon again by Indonesian or Malaysian or another country's ships, how is Beijing likely to respond if it's a very public incident? Well, if you look at the um, surging of China's fishing fleets, for example, in contested waters, uh, with the Philippines, that it adds a further layer of friction to what is already the baseline friction for basic delimitation of both territorial limits, territorial seas limits, and therefore EEZs, um, or should I say EEZs, for our American audience, with the other claimant states in the South China Sea. So fisheries, I think, does contribute to pre-existing border tensions, and I think that's likely to spread as I said before, in the Pacific Island countries. That becomes more material as well, the more the United States, Australia, New Zealand begin to provide uh, real-time information to Pacific Island countries about violations of uh, EEZs by Chinese and other fishing fleets from other countries. A few months ago, US Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi made a scheduled visit to Taiwan. In retaliation for this, Beijing announced it would be cutting all climate cooperation with the United States. But how seriously should we take these threats and what impact is this likely to have on China's climate goals? I think it is strategically illiterate to assume that China would cease acting on climate change because of geopolitical tensions with the United States. I go back to the basic logic. China is acting on climate change. Once it became convinced of the science itself, became convinced, therefore, of the impact on temperature increases in excess of two degrees um, centigrade, on its own country and certainly its impact globally as well as that would affect the possibility of international people movements as well. That would of course be of concern to China. When I first encountered Chinese policy at the Copenhagen conference in 2009, China becoming a willing partner of the United States in climate change action in 2015 at the Paris conference was because the reports had demonstrated that not only was it real, um, but furthermore, that if China itself, as now the world's leading emitter, was not going to act, then China and the rest of the world would be damaged, in some cases irreparably. And furthermore, uh, the focus would increasingly come on China internationally from the G77, 
uh, and emerging countries who are much more climate vulnerable, that China itself was going to be the cause of sea levels rising, greater desertification, etc. In other words, it would become too difficult for China to blame the West and the West's accumulated greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere for the cause of future climate change dislocation. So therefore, when we hear the argument that China may no longer be having a line of communication with John Kerry in the United States on combined climate change action, between the two of them internationally, I must admit I don't become particularly concerned. Within China, the pace at which it implements its uh, China climate change um, mitigation efforts over time by moving out of coal, moving out of hydrocarbons, moving to renewables, etc., uh, will ebb and flow with the economic cycle. Uh, but the strategic imperative for China to act is clear to its own um, political leadership. China is usually much more averse to sending its own troops to fight overseas, but with some of its bordering states like Pakistan, Myanmar and Tajikistan all in the high risk categories for climate change related instability, are we likely to see a shift in that doctrine? With a nation like Pakistan, if the situation begins to degrade, is it likely to deploy its own troops in there to secure the government in Islamabad and regain stability? I think China always regards Pakistan as its problem because of the geopolitical relationship with India and because of China's continuing support for Pakistan's position politically, diplomatically, and to some extent militarily in Kashmir. China cannot afford for Pakistan to become a global economic basket case because Pakistan is China's all-weather ally. By instinct and tradition, therefore, turns to China for large-scale economic aid. You can see that already through the rollout of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, through the so-called Pakistan Economic Corridor, an 80 to $100 billion project, consuming about one-eighth of the total BRA capital intensity around the world, and the single largest project that the Chinese have funded. This would simply be expanded in its scope if an already environmentally precarious Pakistan, uh, with a population from memory of about 200 million people, continues to grow in population, become much more climate vulnerable, and as a result, will turn increasingly to Beijing for emergency assistance. In terms of policing the borders, I think that's less of a concern. it will be more the request for immediate assistance from climate-exposed countries like Myanmar, like Pakistan, who currently have nowhere else really to turn. One of the most common scenarios talked about regarding this issue in particular is the ever-shrinking water levels in the Indus River, running down the spine in Pakistan, a river whose water levels are shrinking more and more with each subsequent summer. Because of this, the government in Islamabad, which is in the north of the country, is already having to make some very tough decisions about what to do with the water, either letting the reduced water levels travel downstream unimpaired or to divert more water from upstream into the northern reservoirs, keeping the northerners happy but effectively imposing a fatal drought upon the Pakistanis in the south, particularly in the dry separatist Baluchistan province. The Baluch people tend to take out their frustrations on Chinese infrastructure projects within the region, the most famous of which being the Port of Wada. If that is the case, are we likely to see China take control of the situation themselves and deploy PLA forces into southern Pakistan? My understanding is that's already the case around Baluchistan, Chinese National Security Services, deploying recently uh, demobbed Chinese military or temporarily demobbed Chinese military to other parts of Pakistan where Chinese projects are unfolding. It's also my understanding that's the case with Chinese projects, for example, within Afghanistan. Many people listening to this podcast will have already done the, the mental map of superimposing climate impact on the world, looking at already uh, the most uh, climate exposed, environmentally uh, unstable parts of the world at present with population density maps with, as well as that, the pre-existing nature of um, security threats, either local or transnational. Now, Balochistan brings those three maps very much together. And so Balochistan has been the nightmare uh, of empires as much as Afghanistan has been. Therefore, security, I think, will end up becoming more of a premium concern for the Chinese uh, in that part of the world, but others as well. Certainly when you look at the remit of Chinese BRI projects in sub-Saharan Africa, climate intensity disrupting pre-existing security problems will also compound the problem there. The other nightmare scenario for China on the other side of the country is North Korea. Climate data is suggesting that whilst the country is already in a fragile state of affairs, the food and resource shortages within North Korea are set to dramatically worsen. And many speculate that the North Korean state government is nowhere near ready to deal with that. 
if we do see a collapse in the Kim regime during this period, what is China's plan? Uh, China's horror scenario is probably twofold on the geopolitics of the Korean Peninsula. One would be Korean reunification under a government in the South which remained an American ally. And that is a horror scenario for Chinese strategic and military planners, which is why China has always been tepid about any effort to bring about unification on the Korean Peninsula. Far better to have it divided than united, because a united Korea is more likely to be, as it were, in the American camp, even though it might be forced to be required to be technically neutral under the terms of reunification. The second scenario which they worry about is the one you've just alluded to, and that is that the economic basket case that already is North Korea, with a bleeding of the limited national budget, driven by appalling sets of economic policies uh, nationally, uh, are then taken into a massive diversion into the Chinese military and the lifestyles of the Korean Workers' Party. If that all became compounded by large-scale famine coming out of large-scale drought or other extreme weather events, and the possibility of massive unstoppable migration flows into China, across the Yalu, uh, into Dadong, and places like that would become a major headache for the Chinese. North Korea is not a small country, it's a population of 20 million or so. If you had a dislocation of several million of those across the border over time, this would create a problem uh, for a country even as large as China. Whilst it's assumed that China will do whatever it can to keep the Kim regime standing upright, it doesn't have those same feelings for many of its other neighbours. This is particularly critical when it comes to some of the important regional waterways that originate in China, like the Ganges or the Mekong. If China is experiencing a bad drought, are they more likely to keep that water for themselves upstream and creating huge shortages downstream, or are they more likely to actually play fair and spread the pain across both countries? Well, this uh, is a problem which has been thrown very much into the entry of Chinese hydrologists as they study the impact of uh, glaciers melting on the entire Himalayan river systems, whichever direction they flow in. So that's one part of it, because as we know, most of the headwaters lie on the Chinese side of the Himalayas. Secondly, you've already seen these debates erupt in terms of the Mekong River system in particular about the question of damming and he who dams upriver, of course, controls the water flows downriver. And secondly, there's also been recent problems on this score, even with the more China-friendly regime in Myanmar. Ultimately, what would China do in terms of blocking water flow? I doubt that they'd want to buy off that level of um, conflict intensity with its neighbours. Remember, China being governed by an entire generation of engineers believes that you can engineer your way out of any problem. I'm not sure engineering, though, ultimately produces the magnitude of the solutions that will be necessary to deal with the climate change and challenge at its source. Over the last few years, we have seen the number and intensity of natural disasters going up quite dramatically in both the United States and in China. In the United States, they're combating this issue by deploying huge amounts of their reserve forces and National Guard to fight fires year round. Are we seeing a similar strategy occurring in China? You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out that the, the statistical intensity of extreme weather events in China is comparable to that we see in other countries around the world. And everyone's National Guard equivalents, in Australia's case, the Special Emergency Services, the police, and from time to time, the military, pulled out for flood and fire. Certainly, this is a major resource diversion for the Chinese. But remember, China already has an internal set of security services which are larger than its external security services because of the nature of the one-party state run on authoritarian lines. In terms of regime legitimacy, there is a view within China that seeing PLA folks out there constructing dams and all the rest is helpful for building party legitimacy, particularly at a time when the party's legitimacy is taking a battering over other factors, such as uh, zero COVID enforcement, such as perhaps declining economic growth, perhaps the long-term fracturing of the social contract around rising living standards as well. So where do you see China on the climate change issue in the next five to 10 years? China's uh, core priority at the moment is to roll out large-scale solar, and in so doing, as China often does, to corner global solar markets and to turn adversity into a global economic opportunity. It's doing that, and as you know, it's cornered the large-scale, cheap manufacture of panels. And I believe when you look elsewhere across the renewable energy 
chain, not just in solar, but in other categories of renewable energies, the Chinese strategy will be to do the same. Roll out at scale at home and then seek to control or dominate uh, the supply chains of comparable technologies abroad. The second, I think, is the intensity of the renewable energy deployment will be accentuated by what China has already identified as being uh, volatile hydrocarbon markets around the world. Yes, they do have reasonable supply of coal domestically, although it's of substandard quality in the most, but that is not possible to be relied upon without creating enormous further environmental damage. Uh, oil and gas, they are significantly externally dependent. So in many respects, the climate argument within China to radically turn to renewables is uh, accentuated by China's national security circumstances. If it sees itself in a future conflict with the United States, for example, it will want to have got to a stage that it's not externally dependent on energy supplies from anybody, Russia or through the Straits of Hormuz and the Straits of uh, Malacca. So curiously, counterintuitively, this pushes forward the renewable energy transformation in China rather than pushing it into reverse. So there's a question so many climate people are watching for when it comes to climate and China. What do the growing tensions between the United States and China mean for each country's climate goals? We already established in the first episode that the Americans are unlikely to compromise on emissions if it means compromising on defense readiness. And many of our sources we approach for this one indicate China would do the same. But whilst the US and China may have large state resources to be able to combat climate change, other players throughout the region definitely don't. So the big question is, is climate change an opportunity or a hindrance for China's strategic ambitions? You see, some in China will look at less prepared nations like Cambodia or Laos and know that when a giant storm inevitably comes through, they'll have very little money to rebuild key infrastructure. And China knows it could be there the next day, check in hand and Chinese construction companies ready to go. Others who are a little more pessimistic see a future where China's supply chains get stretched so thin that Beijing simply turns to isolationism and abandons their neighbors to their own fates. But what is the most likely outcome? And what will Chinese foreign policy look like in a not-so-distant period of climate instability? Well, to answer that, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. The Frail Factory This is a current problem for China right now. You just have to look at what happened this summer with the heat waves and droughts where many of their major rivers dried up completely. It's something that China has to grapple with today and will only get more intense in the future. Aaron Sikorsky is the director for the Center for Climate and Security, as well as the director for the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Previously, Aaron served as the deputy director for the Strategic Futures Group on the US National Intelligence Council, where she also co-authored the Quadrennial Global Trends Report and led the US intelligence community's environmental and climate security analysis. She's also the founding chair of the Climate Security Advisory Council, a congressionally mandated group designed to facilitate coordination between the intelligence community and the US government's scientific agencies. And we're thrilled to have her on the program today. And these rivers are the heart of how things move through the country. They're also sources of fresh water. You look at where China's population density is the greatest, it's around these river basins. So that's not only an opportunity, right, for the Chinese to, to leverage these rivers, but it's also becoming more and more of a risk. China is facing a whole myriad of issues here, but I think a good place to start this conversation is with water security. To lay out the scale of the problem, whilst China holds nearly 20% of the world's entire population, it only holds about 6% of the world's fresh water. But the importance of these rivers doesn't stop there, with these rivers being the primary form of transportation for getting goods from the inland of China to the coastal ports, with these waterways being one of the only things that makes these inland factories economically viable. They're also the primary source of water for agriculture and still the main source of drinking water for much of the local population. And as we can see from the data and the satellite images, many of these rivers continue to recede further and further year by year. If this trend does continue, what impacts you see going forward upon China? And water security overall is a key challenge for China going forward. And something, to be fair, that the government itself is highly concerned about and is employing some of the, you know, biggest infrastructure projects seen in the world to try and manage 
some of those water challenges, moving water from, from one place to another across the country to try and make sure there is fresh water in and, and safe water in some of their most populated areas. The country has some pretty impressive plans, adaptation plans for climate and, and for water security on paper. But when it comes time to implement those plans, there are political dynamics at the local level that get in the way of, of fully implementing those plans. And I think that's a key uncertainty going forward, right? There's no incentive in China if you're a local official to report bad news up. And your number one focus is continued economic development in whatever region you work in. So as water challenges become more acute in different places, as you have got food security overlapping with water security in many different, different places, the question as to whether you know, China will truly be able to implement the, the adaptation plans it's, it's put together, given those local political dynamics, I think will be a real, real challenge. And I also think another challenge for China, I mean, you often see laudatory uh, reports of how far forward thinking they are in their adaptation and they're making these huge investments. But every country is struggling with how fast climate change is actually happening compared to what's on paper and how much more intense the impacts are. And so I think there's an open question as to whether some of these adaptation plans and particularly around water security and water resilience will really meet the the moment, even if they are fully implemented. The other issue here is around dams, and China has nearly 98,000 of them across the country, many of which are hydroelectric dams. And yes, hydroelectric dams are a fantastic source of renewable energy, taking advantage of the water pumping through these dams to power entire cities. The only trouble is that they only work when there's ample water pumping through them, which means that if your river dries up, the hydropower dam also stops working and the nearby city loses power, which means the factories can't work and China doesn't get paid. So water shortages worry China greatly on this front as well. But China's policies to combat this issue worry China's neighbors even more, as important rivers like the Brahmaputra and Ganges in India, the Mekong in Vietnam, or the Sirdaria in Tajikistan all actually originate in China. And China has been building large dams all along their parts of the river upstream. So the amount of water flowing through the Ganges in India is now decided by bureaucrats in Beijing. From the data you have on China and how the Chinese government works though, in a time of great shortage within China, is Beijing more likely to let that water continue to flow downstream or are they more likely to simply take more from it to maintain the amount they usually take, even at the detriment of the nations downstream? We've seen China you know, pursue aggressive dam building on all of these rivers in large part to ensure their access to water going forward. So they're already making investments to try and do that. And this is causing real tensions with China's neighbors, whether it's India and, and the downstream rivers there, or whether it's other countries along the Mekong. We saw in 2019, for example, there was an extreme drought in Thailand and Laos along the lower part of the Mekong River. But at the same time, you had an unprecedented blockage of water supply by Chinese dams in the upper part of the river, right? The upper part of the river was actually quite wet that year, but China uh, blocked that water from, from coming down. And we're not sure why, right? Was it because they wanted to make sure that they keeping the water for themselves? Was it poor data management and understanding on their part? But what it did mean is that millions of people in the Mekong Delta were, were, out, were without fresh water for months because of that combination of drought and the Chinese behavior there. And I think that is an example of the kind of climate security stress we're going to see more going forward, where it's not just climate change alone, right? It's not just the drought alone, but it's the drought plus the actions of either, you know, in this case, the Chinese government. And, and that creates opportunity for further tension among these countries in the region in a way that could be potentially really dangerous. I think especially when you look at China's relationship with India, they're both nuclear armed states. They've had lots of tension along the border. And as you, as you mix together climate change impacts, Chinese damming, Indian skepticism and concern about Chinese behavior, it's a real combustible mix there and, and something I think we'll expect to see more of. Well, putting aside water security, what is China's food security like? We know at the moment the net importers of food, but how is the situation likely to change going forward? 
Right. That's an excellent question. President Xi has called for China to become, quote, self-sufficient in, in food security, stating that the food of the Chinese people must be made by and remain in the hands of the Chinese. But China supports 20 percent of the world's population, has only 12 percent of the world's arable land. So something's got to give somewhere, right? Especially as that land is, is threatened by climate change. And as we've seen, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine this past year and what that the cascading food security effects around the globe have been because of that, I think China will face pressure, right? Its own third climate assessment released about seven years ago found that climate change will negatively affect the country's agriculture due to less reliable rains. You'll have the spread of pests to new regions. You'll have shorter growing seasons and already I mean, we've seen these these changes happening on the ground. The just this past year, the, the agriculture ministry in China acknowledged that this year would the country would face its worst ever harvest. The reason this is important for the rest of the world to to understand and to think about is that I think this will absolutely shape Chinese behavior on the world stage, shape their geopolitical interests, right? Their national interests abroad is this concern about food security and attempting to secure what they need for their population. I think it comes in the issue of fish stocks as well around the globe. And as we've seen those diminish, not only in the South China Sea, but in many other places, we see China acting more aggressively to secure fish all around the world in ways that, that really pushes other countries' boundaries. And I think, again, we can expect to see, see more of that going forward as, as China feels inc uh, increasingly threatened. With fish levels dwindling in Chinese waters, Chinese fishing vessels are pushing further and further out to catch the same amount of supplies they need. And this includes pushing into Philippine, Indonesian, Malaysian and Vietnamese waters, just to name a few. From your analysis, do you think these fishing vessels pushing further into other countries' fishing zones creates a number of international flashpoints when one of these nations inevitably fires upon these boats to stop them illegally fishing and Beijing is then forced to respond to that is this simply just an inevitable flashpoint waiting to happen? I think there's potential for, for pushback, for sure. I mean, as we men you mentioned, the stocks in the South China Sea of fish have already declined by one third over the past 30 years. And China is now the world's largest operator of distance water fishing fleets. And they have gone after fishing boats from Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines and the South China Sea all claiming they were operating in Chinese territory. I think tensions have been raised with these countries and with the United States. There's certainly the risk of flashpoints in, in that region, especially because of China's use of kind of gray zone activity. Yes, you've got the Chinese Coast Guard, but you also sometimes have Chinese fishing boats operating either as cover or in partnership, right, with, with the government there. So the risk of escalation grows as the, the competition over the dwindling fish stocks grow. Looking at some of the media reports, there are a number of people who point to China's aggressiveness in the South China Sea as a reason we should cut all ties with them and refuse to work with them even when it comes to climate change. Does China actually tackling climate change rely on the US giving into their demands? Or frankly, China has to take this issue seriously regardless of what the US does? But I think what affects their behavior on cutting emissions more is, is their perception of the threat climate change poses to China itself, to the CCP, much more so than whether or not the U.S. is cooperating with them. It is important, I think, to send a message on the world stage for the two of them to cooperate, the U.S. and China, for other countries to follow. And so I, certainly I would prefer that they were cooperating, but I also think if the real concern is will China cut emissions or not, or how far will they push themselves to cut emissions, that has much less to do with the U.S. position and much more to do with what China thinks the threat to itself is. As part of our U.S. episode, we we're reporting on the growing problem where the U.S. National Guard and Army Reserves are being increasingly deployed to fight fires, combat floods, fix infrastructure, etc., 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 with these U.S. forces now being deployed nearly year-round to fight natural disasters, which means that in the case of a war with another nation, the U.S. really has no reserve force left, unless they intend on letting fires and whatnot spiral out of control back home. We know this is a problem facing the U.S., but is this a problem also facing China with its internal armed forces? 
the increase in the hazards and the amount of strain is is real, irrespective of kind of what the overarching you know national security strategy is. The man hours that Chinese forces have spent fighting fires and responding to natural disasters has has gone up significantly since 2012. Look at the floods in 2020 and the and the amount of troops that were deployed to respond to that was significant. We've just seen China refuse to release their GDP figures this week, which has sparked a lot of concern from economists abroad that the economy in China is not in a good place. We do know that a number of people in China's senior leadership do worry that many people may turn against them if the growth slows down or disappears. So if the economic outlook continues to worsen, do you think they'll cease all their mitigation strategies if it begins to impact their short-term economic outlook and the situation in China looks shaky? The other thing to look at is perhaps an example or at least some lessons learned to draw from how China might respond is to look at what's happened with COVID. After 2007 and the SARS crisis, China adopted a sophisticated emergency response law, right, which on paper laid out everything you, you should do properly in case of an outbreak. Then when it came to the actual COVID crisis hitting, they didn't follow that plan that was on paper because there was no local political incentive to do so. And so I think you have a similar challenge with climate is they're, they're coming up with these robust adaptation plans and all of this cutting emissions plans um, that look really good on paper. But then when it comes to actually implementation, the, the economic demands of, of today, the political economic demands get in the way. Well, if we look at right now, what projects is China prioritizing at the moment? I think it's really three areas that are most pressing for China. One is the direct risks that climate will pose to military and critical infrastructure. And given the scope of Chinese cities and the uh, how many of them are on the coasts, right, the transportation and energy infrastructure that it relies on, climate is going to affect all of that. That's where you see, frankly, the most attention by the Chinese government when you look at their adaptation planning and the investments they're making is to either reinforce or move that infrastructure in a way to make it more resilient. So I think that is both the most immediate threat and the one that China is is most focused on. The second is compounding risks to domestic stability as we talked about, right? This is where I'd put food security and water security issues. Climate will threaten China's ability to eradicate poverty. It will exacerbate inequality within the country. And I think that's where there's perhaps the most longer term risk for for China, especially because so much of its plans for adaptation are focused on physical risks and physical infrastructure. And as we know, again, from from the COVID crisis and other studies of what builds true resilience in countries, it's not just tangible things, physical things. It's also things like political inclusion, right? Not having exclusive political institutions, um, dealing with inequality, not having high levels of polarization, having strong levels of trust in government. All of those things are necessary for countries to be able to weather extreme climate hazards. And so I think as the hazards get more intense, China will struggle to manage that political instability. And then the third bucket of risk for China are the amplifying geopolitical tensions in their region, in particular, as we talked about with the shared river basins, but also more broadly, globally, as they go after fish stocks, as they work in the Arctic to secure access there, calling themselves a, quote, near Arctic power. Uh, I think this changes the climate can potentially change the geopolitical game in ways for for China that it's trying to take advantage of and set itself up to take advantage of. Right. With like I said, with critical minerals, but it can also create challenges and risks there. What do you think this means from a U.S. perspective and how do you think Washington is viewing these developments? So it really faces, like most countries, the full spectrum of of risks. But the one I, I worry most about probably vis-a-vis U.S. security is that those domestic stability risks and what does it mean for the U.S. if there is tense climate hazard that causes real domestic instability in China, that that poses risks potentially globally. Again, from an American perspective, particularly an American political perspective and the conversations I hear in Washington and on Capitol Hill is that climate change is is a benefit to China, right? That climate that China is taking advantage of climate change and they'll be they'll come out on top because they have a, an ability to 
plan ahead, right? And and they can they can get ahead of all of this and they can take advantage of it. And certainly they're trying to in some cases, but I think there's a misunderstanding of how difficult climate change will be for mainland China itself, and perhaps how brittle some of the Chinese ability to manage those challenges are. As we talked about earlier, it's it's a difference between what's written on paper and what's actually implemented, and that some of the adaptation investments, while they're perhaps very impressive in terms of physical infrastructure, don't have the socio-political infrastructure behind them to make them effective. And some of the most affected regions by climate impacts, which will be Tibet and others, are already highly volatile and, and of high concern for the Chinese government. There's still, not only in China, but elsewhere, a tendency to underestimate the impact of climate hazards. You know, we always choose the the middle road when we're, as opposed to the, the most concerning road <laughs> regarding climate. And what we've seen time and again is that things are happening faster and, and more intensely than, than previously predicted. And that creates potential brittleness for China. So China is already beginning to worry about its economic situation and how it's gonna fund the projects within its own borders. So what should the countries like Uganda, Iraq, Tanzania, and Kyrgyzstan, who are being propped up by Belt and Road money coming in from China, be thinking? If these problems become worse for China internally, will the checks to these countries just stop appearing? And these governments that took BRI funding may have giant holes in their budget appear overnight. Will China's urgency to fix things at home prevent them from fixing things abroad? Well, to answer that, we turn to our third guest. Part 4. Seeding Sovereignty Climate change already has a major impact on China, very visible just the last two years. December, Sichuan and some of the other provinces in the upper Yangtze Valley River, they had a, a, one of the biggest droughts in modern history, some says it's the biggest drought in 1,000 years of history. It had a lot of secondary effects also, like hydropower coming down uh, dramatically in provinces where hydropower is the main source of energy, which of course affected air conditioning or, and it affected the, the, the business run in Sichuan and some of the other provinces. Last year, Hunan province had the opposite, uh, the most severe flooding in uh, recent years. 200 millimeters of rain came in one hour uh, in the massive city of Shenzhou alone. Uh, about 300 people died, and the cost for the economy were big. So there is absolutely no doubt that China has uh, very, very severe rains and flooding and very severe droughts, and that's exactly what we were to expect coming from climate change. Eric Solheim is the president of China's entire Green Belt and Road Initiative. He's also the former Undersecretary General of the United Nations, the former Environment Minister for Norway, the Chair of the OECD Development Assistance Committee, and the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program. So there are a few people in the world who know these issues better than Eric does, and we're thrilled to have him on the program today. For the civilian population, I think it's fair as fair. Dry areas uh, like in northwest of China may become drier, and uh, wet areas may see more flooding. You may see uh, sea level rise affecting the coastal areas of China. But if you ask about military sense, it's much more complicated because conflict may be amplified uh, by natural catastrophes and by climate change. All military forces in the world are struggling with how to operationalize the effects of climate change. Pentagon, as well as uh, China, has realized that climate change is a major potential amplifier of wars, but the struggle to uh, or operationalize what, what it actually means. Does it mean that you should supply solar panels rather than drones to war-affected areas like, say, Somalia? Does it mean you should move military barracks from areas which are potentially overflooded by, by river flooding or by, by sea level rise? What does it actually mean, I think? One potential way of operationalizing it for, for China would be in its massive peacekeeping efforts. And China is a major contributor to the UN peacekeeping forces. And of course, conflicts like those we have, been, we have seen in Sudan uh, or in Somalia 
or in parts of the Sahel where jihadist groups are attacking. These are areas where conflict may be substantially amplified by climate change and where China needs to prepare for its operations in a UN context. Do these future peacekeeping operations include China's neighbouring states, nations like Pakistan who just experienced the worst flooding in a very long time? Uh, China is highly likely to support in a humanitarian sense. They already did this summer. Uh, were massive Chinese aid to, to Pakistan after the after the flooding in, in Pakistan. And for sure, you will see China help the neighbors in any potential way in the humanitarian sense. However, China has a long-lasting resistance to being involved in wars and conflicts. Remember that China is the one member of the Security Council which is using its uh, the veto power the least. China has not been involved in any conflict outside China of any size since the attack on Vietnam in 1979. So China tend to try to stay out of domestic conflicts in other parts of the world. This, of course, may change in the future, and it may particularly change, of course, if some of these conflicts are seen as security threats to China itself. But unless China itself comes under a real threat, I think you should expect China to be big on humanitarian efforts, but very limited when it comes to military interference in neighboring states. Obviously, there are hundreds of countries calling out for Chinese investment at the moment, but what countries and projects are the Chinese government prioritizing with the Green Belt and Road Initiative? First of all, of course, Belt and Road is by far the most important uh, investment scheme in our era. While Belt and Road is affecting about 140 nations, far away from the traditional Silk Road between uh, China and Europe. I mean, nearly all nations of Latin America, for instance, are uh, green Belt and Road, of course, hints to the fact that in the early days, Belt and Road was a lot about coal, was about infrastructure, and, and energy infrastructure was coal. Last year, President Xi promised that China will not put a full stop to all overseas coal investment, which was a very, very important decision, probably the most important decision for the environment in the world over the last couple of years. Uh, and we, now, we, we will now see China investing heavily in solar, in wind, in green hydrogen, in hydropower, and all the green energies. So this is really an all-encompassing uh, investment program, and we will see it go very, very green in the years to come. Again, just to mention, Laos, uh, China Railroad was finalized last year, and now Trans Thailand and Trans Malaysia Railroads are, are, are worked upon. In Indonesia, the Bandung uh, Jakarta Railroad will very soon open. Uh, in Hanoi, China has constructed the, the metro. So there are, there are so many green projects in Belt and Road. In the past, there was many brown, there were many brown projects, but now it's all, all about going green. As part of these initiatives, China has invested heavily into areas of the world that provide China with food, which is very crucial to keep friendly as China is a net food importer. Knowing Chinese funding practices as well as you do, I have a question about Chinese food security. With crop yields predicted to fall in many of the countries China does receive its food from, the supply will drop, but at the same time the demand will grow, which will push the prices up. Food has always been a pressure point for the Chinese population, so is Beijing more likely to pass that inflationary pressure onto its citizens needing food and cause food crises within China, or is it more likely to implement huge government spending programs in these food areas to help subsidize the food costs in the name of keeping prices steady? I think the government of China is highly likely to find ways to subsidize food and make sure that there is no lack of food anywhere in China, because China has the extremely bitter experience with the so-called Great leap forward in around 1960, where tens of millions of Chinese perished in a, uh, in hunger and famine. So that that's still in, on, on the minds of, of many old, older Chinese. So I think the government will do whatever it can to make sure that people of China is uh, not lacking food. So I'm not really worried with the food systems for China itself, but of course, if China and the West is importing um, food and it may have major impact on other, other developing countries who are much less set up to tackle a, a food calamity. What about China's allies? If China's keeping up and feeding its own people, but friendly nations like Myanmar or Pakistan or Laos are going through their own food crises, is China likely to divert some of its own food from its citizens toward its allies to keep them afloat? 
I think we, we, we must realize that the president, President Xi and the political leadership of China is, of course, there for China. I mean, the, the number one priority will always be uh, to make sure uh, that uh, the Communist Party has support from the people of China and that the people of China is not suffering uh, in, any, uh, in any way from hunger. It's not just food they have to supply, though. Water is also critical to many areas of China. We're already seeing water shortages in areas like Tibet, in Mongolia and Xinjiang, and China has already implemented strict sets of water rationing and restrictions to combat this. But these can only go so far. So how does China plan on addressing this water issue, and does Beijing view this as a source of potential conflict between the central government and the Uyghur, Mongolian and Tibetan peoples who live in those areas? Yeah, of course, uh, conflicts over water is one of the most likely potential crisis scenarios coming from climate change. In the worst case, with a severe shortage of water, for Xinjiang uh, and in Mongolia, climate change is a huge opportunity for economic economic growth, even if, of course, uh, climate change may cause concerns. However, China is also the, by, now, by far the biggest tree plant in the world, one-fourth of the increased tree cover in the last uh, decade that came in China. And a lot of that is happening in, in places like in Mongolia, where some of the deserts have been turned green in a extremely impressive uh, fashion from any global global context. So it's a mixed mixed bag. Yes, there are for sure concerns for these um, peripheral comfort, uh, provinces of China. But overall, I believe particularly Xinjiang and in Mongolia is not, is not likely to benefit from, uh, from climate action. So China has been consolidating a lot of the market in solar and battery technology, with a huge amount of today's green tech being built in China. How important is China becoming to the green technology market? China is highly likely to move very, very fast in the green direction, whatever. The main reason for that is, of course, that this is, makes economic sense for China. China is a massive importer of oil and gas. That oil and gas can be replaced by solar and wind or hydro domestic resources. China saves a lot of money at, in, at the state budget. But much more importantly, China is now dominating every single green technology in the world. 82% of all solar panels last year in the world were made in China. 70% of all electric batteries in the world last year were made in China. If you buy a Tesla, yes, it's a car developed by Elon Musk in California. But half the value of the car is a battery. Uh, and that, that electric battery is highly likely to be made in China. And of course, China didn't have a, a massive historical automobile industry, like say Volkswagen in Europe or Toyota in Japan or General Motors in the US. So for them, it made absolute sense to move right into the electric cars. And now half of all electric cars in the world uh, are sold in China. And this and the number of new brands coming out of China in, in the electric space. So China is not uh, doing uh, the electric change or the green transformation just for the sa sake of climate or to reduce pollution. They're doing it because that will provide jobs and prosperity for the people of China. There are some out there who view China's climate goals with skepticism, but there are others who view this strictly through a defensive lens. Just from a defense perspective, for years, China has been incredibly worried about the effects a US blockade would have on China, knowing how reliant the Chinese economy is on the ability to send goods abroad, as well as import materials in to power those factories. So on that front, China combating the issue of climate change makes a lot of sense. If China doesn't need the Middle East for oil, or Russia for wheat, they can focus all their attention on home where it's most needed. But achieving this is a pretty tall feat. As we discussed in the previous episode, the US has known about this issue since the 1980s, and the DoD has been taking this very seriously for a few decades now. But even then, the US is nowhere near ready. The Chinese have only recently come around to the idea of preparing for climate change and are piloting a far less diversified economy with huge pollution levels and a population almost three times the size of the US. For China to attempt these mitigation strategies is effectively like trying to skip from the US's industrial position in the 1950s straight to where the US will be in the 2030s. And it sounds almost impossible, but what other choices China have? With every increasing natural disaster, the Chinese people become less satisfied in their arrangement, trading personal liberties for economic prosperity. These fast approaching circumstances I mean, China has to prepare geopolitically for flashpoints in almost every one of its 14 bordering states, 
as well as its ethnic minority states like Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet, as well as from the local population in the major cities as well. And with a one-party state, and increasingly one-man rule at the helm, there's no one else to blame. The decisions made here and now, if it goes right, it goes right because of the party. But if it goes wrong, it goes wrong because of the party. These decisions made here and now by just a select few people will set the course for over a billion people in China, and in turn, the global economy as a whole. So he is hoping they make the right call. Thank you so much for tuning into the second episode of this brand new mini-series, and we've been absolutely loving putting this project together. We received a whole bunch of feedback and emails on the first episode, and it was amazing to see all the great feedback on it. Going into this project, we had no idea if people would actually be ready to jump on board with it. So for myself and the entire team, thanks for jumping on this one. As we talked about in the first episode, we've been working with a specialty climate change research think tank called Mission Climate Project, allowing us to take our security expertise and match it up with their climate expertise and data. And the two of us working together has meant we're actually able to plot out exactly where the regional flashpoints will be from a climate perspective and lay the security data sets over the top to give us incredibly accurate flashpoint spots. There are three more full episodes left of this series and a bunch of Twitter spaces and panels coming up as well, which will all be coming out over the next six weeks. So we hope you stick with us on this one. If this is the first time you've checked out the program or you want to find out more about the project or anything else we're up to, you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. This is a bit of a different project, but we're still going to keep some of the red line consistencies here. So as we always do on the red line, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Politics in China, an introduction by William A. Joseph. This is a book I read a while ago, and it really laid out the foundations of some of my key concepts about how the Chinese bureaucracy runs. And the second is China's Next Act, How Sustainability and Technology Are Reshaping China's Rise and the World's Future by Scott M. Moore for a look at China's role within the tech industry. And the third is Nomad Century by Gaia Vince for a look at how climate change is very likely to exacerbate already tense migration issues. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Lou Munden, Aaron Sikorsky, Eric Solheim, and Kevin Rudd. It was an absolutely fantastic panel to put together this week. I also want to thank my staff who did so much work on this project. Wade McCarr, our current producer, as well as a thanks to our previous producer who did a lot of prep work for this particular episode during the early stages. I also want to thank Perry Grace, Daniela Zivella, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist and in-house climate change expert, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Ross Crabtree, our media revisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. In addition to my team, I also want to thank the amazing team over at TMP, who supplied huge amounts of the data and are instrumental in helping us put this project together. So a big thanks goes out to Ben Bowie, Tim Garcia, Willie Munden, Ivana Popkova, Peter Riggs, and Lou Munden. The TMP team has produced stacks of amazing research and data on this particular issue, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with them on this one. The Green Line will be back in a fortnight, and the Red Line will be back airing a regular episode in a week's time. But until then... Thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.